Uh, hi, everybody. I'm very excited to give this lecture um, that is focused on mental imagination. And more specifically, it focuses on individual differences. This lecture is based on some discussion I had with uh, Sir Ken in Montreal in 2018, uh, where I presented a project that I will share with you on how we can use mental imagination of blind people in order to enable them to see the surrounding using sounds, music, and their imagination. Uh, so to go and pick up their shoes or look at their facial expressions and so on. Um, and, you know, the basis of these uh, uh, discussions that we had was uh, uh, based on Kent's uh, lecture on how in education we, we focus a lot on on the average, yeah? So we try to teach everyone the same material and so on, uh, while there is huge individual differences. And if you tap into these individual differences, you are much more powerful. And that made me realize that in neuroscience and in brain studies, uh, many times, uh, you know, we focus on, on the average brain while uh, not on the individual differences. Uh, I would start by, by showing you uh, a project uh, on, on mental imagination in which we uh, use the new technology we developed in the lab called the eye music. Uh, this technology capture images uh, to the blind, to the blind uh, blind. And he's like, for example, here looking on the apples. Um, and uh, this is translated into sounds and music, just like, uh, you know, uh, bats and dolphins create an image based on spectrogram and they use their mental imagination to see in their mind eye what's in front of them and operate on it. And what is interesting here is that uh, uh, inside the sound, what I'm showing you here is spectrogram, which show high tones, middle tones, and low tones over time. And you can see that if I will play to you, it will sound like you will see here in a second, like very complex sounds. But actually inside these sounds, there are shapes hidden. Like in this case, the famous equation of Albert Einstein. So they listen to it and they know what's written on the wall, okay? Uh, so let me just give you one small example. So this is how a diagonal line will sound. So high, uh, it's scanned from left to right. So for example, a smile will be something like and a set face will be So the music draws and the blind imagine what's in the surrounding. So this is the first lesson. After about 10 to 40 hours of training, blind can do uh, the following things. <laughs> what you saw so far is two congenitally blind that picking uh, shoes or apples. You can see here in this movie, uh, blind analyzing the sounds and using this mental imagination and being able to say if uh, the person in front of them is smiling or a sad face and so on and so forth. Wow, wow. Amazing. Okay, so the question is, so we can take images and using this iMusic algorithm, encode this in soundscape. So you see the resolution is lower and it takes about 40 hours to learn it. But then we put the blind uh, or, or blindfold sighted in MRI machine and scan what happened in the brain. And what happened when they use this mental imagination and build the image around them. And what we see is that actually the brain sends the information after the learning process from the hearing system into the seeing system. And when the person is building all this complex, it takes them about three, four seconds. So it's much lower than vision. And it's using the sound to build, using imagination, the surrounding and recognize it. And once he's recognizing, actually it's the seeing brain that is doing this. So it's moving the information from the hearing brain into the seeing brain. So you see here this video from hearing to these red areas, which is the seeing system. So it's, it's pretty amazing that, that first of all, the brain somehow self-organized itself uh, and reactivate the seeing system when we mentally imagine, imagine the surrounding. 
So it's the same areas that are activated in seeing versus imagining. And this is actually fitting with a lot of other studies uh, used on site that asking them, for example, to imagine face, and we see there is activity in the face region, but not in the reading system, yeah? Or not in the hearing system. So, so far, what we showed is that the same brain areas are active when we see and when we imagine, and we can use these same areas to teach blind individuals to recycle these areas to imagine the visual world based on sounds, okay? But that's, now I'm going to the back to the intro and, and this very interesting discussion I had with Sir Ken is that there is, first of all, seeing and imagining is not the same thing, although they active the same brain areas. And two, there is huge individual differences. So some people like me have very poor visual imagery. I have actually pretty decent music imagery. I can imagine whole songs, no problem, but seeing nothing. I can close my eyes, I don't see anything. And there is some people looking at five minutes movie and they can replay with colors, with shapes, everything very vividly. So the problem is that, that like, just like in education, in neuroscience, we don't uh, use much, we don't look much on these individual differences. So this was the goal of this project and we found something super interesting here. Uh, so first of all, we, need, we, we can all know that it's not the same thing because for example, when a person cannot tell if something happened in reality or he imagined it, we talk about hallucination, right? Or about even psychosis. So really it's diff two different things in the brain. We need to find the mechanism. And second, we need to find out why some people have poor visual imagery like me and some have this amazing visual imagery like uh, other people. Um, so what we found is really interesting. Uh, first of all, we, we, you see here the average, not the individual differences, but the average brain activity of people that looking on objects or imagining them. So first of all, you see that there is a reactivation of the seeing brain, but it's much weaker on average than really seeing. On the other hand, there is this blue areas, which means we suppress the hearing brain, the touch brain, the pathway from the eye, so people, what we found is that you can, when you imagine, you need to reactivate your seeing brain, but you need to shut down everything else because you need to recreate something that is not existent. Now, can we look at these mechanisms and now explain why some people have poor imagery like me and some people have an amazing? And the answer is yes. This time we look on all the individual brain scans like here, yeah? And now we correlate how much you shut down your other systems versus how much vivid is your mental imagination. And this is exactly what we found. People like me that probably cannot shut down the other systems very well, have poor vividness and people, other people much better at shutting down these other systems and may able to recreate the thing seen based on this activity. So this is really interesting. First mechanisms of the individual differences and this led me to the last uh, part of the story. We had the pleasure of, uh, uh, it's a very anecdotal studies. All the studies I, I shared with you so far were uh, highly publi uh, published in, in peer reviewed journals and it's including uh, big studies. And here it's an anecdotal story and it's only one case, but it's a very special case of a person that had really uh, trusted imagination and used it a lot. And this is of course the, the brain of Albert Einstein uh, the story of how people got to study the anatomy of Albert Einstein brain versus the typical average brain is, is crazy, okay? It's a, it should be a basis of a Netflix series. Um, but the bottom line is that when you look on the average brain of, of the average brain versus Einstein's brain, in most of the areas, the pattern is very similar. The patterns of mountains and valleys. But there is one area which have a very unique fingerprint. And, and this was uh, published by Sandra Whittleson in Lancet showing it's this area have a unique fingerprint versus the typical brain. So this is the individual brain of Albert Einstein. They have the individual fingerprint. And what we did in the lab, we study what is this brain area is doing. And what we found is that it's involved mental imagination, but this time not of vision per se, like what I show you so far, but imagining your body 
in relation to space around it. Now, this is really fascinating. It's very anecdotal. It's a bit uh, of a, uh, a jump, yeah, a conceptual jump. But I, I found it to be too tempting then not to mention that Albert Einstein was very famous in his thought experiments, the Gedanken experiments. But what is people less realizing is that most of it, this thought experiment involving mentally imagining his body in relation to space and time. So there is the famous experiments of him imagining his body riding on a, on a wave of light. And there is another in which he imagined himself in an elevator and thinking about gravitation. And so it's very tempting to say maybe, now this is very maybe, but it's intriguing, that he had this very unique ability to do this mental imagination experiments. And some of it might, together with his very powerful reliance on mathematics, were the basis of, of his uh, amazing uh, theories, and especially, uh, especially the theory of relativity. Yeah, so I just want to finish with this uh, famous quotation of uh, Albert Einstein, that uh, knowledge is limited and imagination in cycles the world. And it's, uh, this is why it's more important. And we, just to summarize that we have many types of imagination. It's not just one system. There is many systems of imaginations. And the second thing is that we have huge individual variability and differences in these capabilities. So we should, first of all, use these differences to study the brain, but also tailor the learning process and the education system and the education process to these different imagination capabilities, develop each one of them, and tailor the learning and the development based on these individual differences. So I will finish here and thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Ido Aharoni. I am the global ambassador and co-founder of the Genius 100 Foundation. Genius 100, also known as the G100, was inspired by Albert Einstein's vision, by Albert Einstein's emphasis on imagination and his ability to empower people to think beyond the boundaries of the convention. In 2015, as we prepare to celebrate 100 years to Einstein's general theory of relativity, we gathered 100 accomplished and compassionate minds who have reimagined the future and improved our world in order to help us celebrate and inspire others, especially young people, but not just young people. Sir Ken Robinson was one of the most active, most passionate, most creative and imaginative members of our community. He was not only an active visionary, but he was a major source of attraction for the hundreds of influential people surrounding the 100 visionaries. We know today that his voice is needed more than ever before. The pandemic has disrupted our lives in many ways. Yet, the silver lining that we see here is that the pandemic emphasized the need to embrace change. If there's only one thing that we know that is constant and permanent is the necessity to embrace change, to adapt, to adjust wherever we go. And so as we continue to celebrate the life of Sir Ken Robinson and celebrate his wisdom and his teachings, we hope that his desire, his hope, to rethink our school system and cultivate creativity that acknowledges that there are multiple types of intelligences will be realized and we are humbled and honored to be part of that effort. To follow this short presentation is Sir Ken's talk at the celebration of 100 years to the uh, theory of relativity which took place in Montreal, Canada a couple of years ago. And that will be followed by a reading of his vision statement by several of his fellow visionaries. His statement was included in the 3D book publishing milestone titled Genius 100 Visions of the Future. Thank you so much for having us. It's all true. 
I am tremendously distinguished. <laughs> Except here, in this room. I wish I hadn't come now. I used to feel good about myself. <laughs> it's been a fantastic morning, hasn't it? Genuinely. Fantastic. See, my work uh, for a long time has been about education. And I've been struck by a paradox for a long time, which is this, that children love to learn, don't they? I mean, think, in like the first 18 months, they learn to speak. And you don't teach them. You know, you don't sit them down at 18 months, do you, and say, look, we need to talk. <laughs> you know. <laughs> or more specifically, you do. <laughs> they don't all like education, and a lot of them have a problem with school. And one of the consequences is that many kids come through college, just like we're hearing now from Nancy, or go, th go through school, without discovering what they're good at or with any understanding if they're good at anything, whatever. Our systems are based on a very narrow view of ability. And the consequence of that is you automatically generate a very expansive conception of disability. Uh, people get drawn to a particular view of things and then conclude that you are the problem. So my work for a long time has been about trying to transform the culture of education with a richer conception of human talent and creativity. And for me, imagination and creativity are really what set us apart from the rest of life on Earth. Very little does, and we make a big mistake when we think we're different from the rest of life on Earth. But in one respect, at least, we are different. We have very powerful imaginations. And from that flow all the practical uh, competencies of creativity. Creativity, in a way, is putting your imagination to work. Now, can I ask you a couple of questions? Uh, how many of you here are doing exactly what you thought you'd be doing when you were 15? <laughs> okay, well look, you may be in the field you wanted to be in, but this life? And yet we persist in the myth that education is a sure preparation for what happens to our children later on. Education is based on three big principles. I'm not talking about particular schools or teachers. There are wonderful teachers, great schools. I'm talking about the culture of education. One uh, principle, is conformity. So we have a narrow view of ability, and if people don't conform to that, we think they're the problem. How many of you have got children of your own? Okay. Or somebody else's, I don't care. <laughs> anyway. And the rest of you have seen such children, presumably, so... <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Well, have you got two children or more? Anybody? All right. Or seen two? <laughs> I'll make you a bet, and I'll win it. My bet is they are completely different from each other, aren't they? You would never mistake them, would you? Like, which one of you? Remind me. You know, <laughs> doesn't it? Education is based on conformity. Human life is based on diversity. And that's the problem. Diversity gets crushed in a system that isn't celebrating it. Whether it's gender or sexuality or ethnicity or pure talent. Uh, the second principle uh, that education is based on is compliance. Most countries now, and particularly in North America, spend literally billions of dollars every year on testing on the basis of standardized criteria. And yet all our children are completely different. And this system is stifling the very capacities on which our children depend, creativity. And the reason that is, I think, is because the third principle is linearity. We think education, or at least it seems that we think education, is like a process of supply and demand. But the truth is, everybody creates their own life. Life is full of dog-leg turns. It's not linear, it's organic. The best evidence of human creativity is your own biography. There have been 100 billion people on this planet, and every life has been different, unrepeatable. Some people have the lives they deserve, and some people never discover the talents inside themselves in order to have that life. And my mission, so to speak, is to reform education based on the principles of creativity and diversity and organic growth. Human resources, I think, are very much like the Earth's natural resources. They are highly diverse. They're often hidden from view. Uh, you have to find them, and then you have to decide what you can do with them. You have to develop them. And I think we need to start applying this metaphor of organic growth, of ecological development, to our children. Because we now face existential problems on the planet. And as we heard earlier, these aren't being caused by the lemurs and the foxes, they're being caused by us. The great gift of creativity is to make connections. That's what Einstein did. His physics was inspired often by his uh, involvement in music. He saw the past and the future as well as the present. That's the gift of creativity, and we can't afford to stifle it in our children, in our schools. We have to make that front and center of the life that we give them through education. In other words, we want our kids to have the best life they can live by discovering what's inside them in a world that they deserve to have. Thank you.
for our children to thrive now and in future, we have to reimagine education. Imagination and creativity are at the root of every uniquely human achievement. Poignantly, they have now brought us to a critical pass. Our appetites are straining the Earth's capacity to sustain us, and our attempts to force it to do so are fueling a holocaust of other species. Our technologies are evolving exponentially, but spiritually and emotionally, we're not keeping pace. To meet these existential challenges, we have to harness our creativity to a more sustainable vision of the lives we hope to lead. Mass systems of education are based on conformity, standardization and competition, and they are failing us badly. Our children urgently need forms of education based on diversity, creativity, and collaboration. Diversity. Human capacities are stunningly diverse, which is why human accomplishments are so breathtakingly multifarious. Rather than focus on a particular forms of academic ability, education should cultivate and celebrate this diversity. Creativity. Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. He did not mean that fantasy is more important than facts, but that the boundaries of knowledge are constantly reset by bold visions and transcendent questions. Collaboration. We are social creatures. Every civilization is built on a fragile ecology of ideas, systems, and expertise, only a fraction of which any one of us can understand. As Einstein puts it, the aim of education must be the training of independently acting and thinking individuals who see in the service of the community the highest life problem. Around us and within us, we all have the resources that we need to be able to meet the challenges that we face. The only way to develop and focus these resources is through forms of education that reconnect us with the natural world of which we are part and the deeper qualities that make us who we are. Cold reason is not enough. As Einstein noted, we've learned by painful experience that rational thinking does not suffice to solve the problems of our social life. The lesson we most need to learn is that there's more to life on Earth than human beings. And there's more to being human than self-interest. Our futures all depend on learning this lesson by heart.